Hi, I'm Kathy Crundle, President of Audubon University, and I'm here today on Audubon Spotlight to talk a little bit more about one of the cardinal experiences that we introduced in our last show. We talked about the idea of Audubon combining experiential learning, that is learning that extends beyond the classroom, going beyond the boundaries of our classrooms and beyond our campus and beyond Westerville, out into the community and in fact out into the world. So as we talked about uh, before, those cardinal experiences as we call them consisted of internship and professional experience opportunities, students being involved working with faculty on original research or creative activity projects, um, students being involved in um, citizenship and leadership activities, students being involved through our Center for Community Engagement, working with community partners, uh, schools, nonprofits, social agencies, uh, to try to improve the lives and the, and the quality of life and opportunities for uh, individual citizens in our region. Um, we also talked about citizenship and leadership, students exercising leadership roles on campus and off campus. But the fifth cardinal experience that we talked about was global engagement. And today we wanted to focus in on the idea of students doing study abroad experiences or working in a global environment, going out into the world. So I asked one of our students who has had a, a global engagement experience, a study abroad experience, Tegan Johnson, um, to join me today. Um, Tegan is a senior. She's from Van Wert, Ohio, and she's a psychology major and art minor. So I wanted to just, I guess, elaborate for you a little bit on what these global engagement experiences really provide for our students. So um, actually, Tegan and I are from the same part of Ohio, Northwestern Ohio, so we were sharing some stories about um, the Northwestern Ohio and the, the rural, that flat countryside, those flatlands up in Northwestern Ohio. Um, but I was asking her about how she found her way to Otterbein and in particular how she decided to do a study abroad experience, so, uh, one of those cardinal experiences that involves uh, global engagement. So Tegan, uh, tell me about how you really found the program that you pursued and why did you decide to do a study abroad experience? Um, I first heard about the study abroad from my French professor. Um, we have a couple programs over in France, but most of them entailed um, being fluent. I'm just not that good at French. Um, so I looked into some other programs, and I found um, Maastricht had a mostly business program, but they started a psychology one, and it was actually an official program just last year. And um, they said I could go and take all my classes and get credits that would transfer back, so I thought, why not? So as a psychology major at the time, um, what made you decide to pursue a program that was primarily business? Were you a kind of guinea pig on this? I was kind of the pioneer. Somebody had gone the year before me, um, kind of to test the waters, and then they officially opened up the program with the neuroscience department in Maastricht um, the year I was going. So I was the first from Otterbein to officially be a neuroscience student there. And you were there for how long? Four and a half months. Okay. And tell me about the courses that you took there. Um, I took a couple entry-level courses because I wasn't real sure what their programs would be like. Um, but my favorite, I took a neuroscience, which was a level three, which is like our fourth year. Um, and we got into a lot of biology, and I loved it. We did a lot of, we dissected some brains. It was really cool, and it kind of changed my whole thought processes. To what? I think I'm... I've changed from a cognitive psychologist to a bio biological psychologist, so it really, really changed my whole career path, mostly. So now, in terms of, you came here to be a psychology major, mm -hmm. you were interested in art, and you went on the program in Maastricht and you changed your mind, um, going a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, if you reflect back on this, um, I think you said you talked with your parents a little bit about this as well. Did they encourage you to pursue oh, definitely. study abroad? Definitely. Why did they think that was a good idea? Um, they thought it was a good experience. Um, I know they never got out of the United States till they were older, and they thought it would be a good thing for me to see the rest of the world a little bit while I was younger. I can absorb some and use that later in life, and I think I definitely will. Okay, so did you live, tell me about the living circumstances. I think we, we're going to be running some, rolling some pictures of, <laughs> yes. of dorm rooms and other kinds of things. So we let's just lived talk in, about um, it. Yeah. It, was a, it was a big dorm just for exchange students. Um, this is my tiny, tiny dorm room that I shared with um, actually a girl from Szechuan, China. Um, we just met when we got there and we had a little kitchen in our room and everybody in the building was foreign meaning not Dutch. So I met some Americans, I met some Italians, um, 
that's an Australian friend that I met. We lived in the same dorm, um, traveled together. You just meet so many great people um, and went a lot of places. It's so easy to travel throughout Europe while you're there. It's, it's like a bus ticket to go to the next country. It's fantastic. <laughs> so how many countries did you visit? Um, I think the final count was 13. I see the Eiffel Tower there. Started in France, <laughs> <laughs> kind of worked our way around. Um, Maastricht is about an hour bus ride from Germany, and it's okay. about an hour train to Belgium. Actually, excuse me, it's a walk to Belgium, but you can take it to a big city in about an hour. Okay. So how, talk to me about your language skills. How much did you develop your <laughs> language skills? I know your French was not quite fluent. Right. But um, that wasn't really necessary in Holland. They all speak very good English. Um, and even if you try to speak Dutch, they'll recognize that you're not very good at it, and they'll speak English to you automatically. So um, I learned my grocery list, and please and thank you, and that's about all you needed, really. Well, of course, then there's chocolate. Right. Yeah, you did learn chocolate, <laughs> right. I assume. Same. <laughs> uh, well, I guess that was probably on your grocery list on a weekly. Definitely. <laughs> on a weekly. But um, Dutch chocolate is something to be, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's a it force is. of nature, It's I something think. I miss very, very much. <laughs> OK. so. Um, now, who did the cooking in your dorm room? You were with a, a girl from Sichuan, China. Um, we, we mostly cooked our own meals. She had some interesting dishes that I decided not to sample. Okay. <laughs> um, we just had our little stove area, and um, you could only cook what you could take back with you from the grocery store on a bike. Ah. So that kind of limited things. Eggs weren't real easy to take back on a bike. Right. <laughs> um, so ate a lot of rice, okay. actually. We okay. shared that in common. All right. So <laughs> in terms of, of um, just your view of, I guess, let's say, United States culture since you came back. That would include the arts. It would include food, mm -hmm. entertainment. Talk to me about changes that you, in your day-to-day -day life, do you see the impact of your experience um, in a different culture affecting your day-to-day -day life here? Definitely. A lot of foreigners would comment, well, I guess they were natives there, would comment on how much Americans rush at everything. We never want to sit down and just have a cup of coffee. We would sit down and have coffee there all the time, just sit and talk. Um, so I definitely take, take a lot more time out just to sit, just to talk and reflect and think. Do you do your own cooking now? Yes. <laughs> Has it changed? Um, I have slightly better ingredients with a car, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so just basic. What about art? Um, you went as an art minor, mm -hmm. um, and you experienced, I am assuming, some of the wonderful venues for art display, art experiences, music experiences in Europe. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about that. Has your perspective on art and its role in your life changed? Um, I would say so. I mean, I definitely saw like the Louvre, and um, we went to Florence, saw all this great art. But the, what really struck me was all the buildings there are so beautiful. And they're not built for function, necessarily. They're also built to be beautiful, and they're old, and everything's. It's OK to build something to be beautiful, mm -hmm. not just like industrialized buildings. Mm -hmm. I definitely appreciate that a lot of Lowe's over there. OK. So now, do you live in a, a residence hall, a dormitory here, or are you in an apartment? I'm in my own apartment. In your own apartment. Mm -hmm. so, so you're doing your own cooking now, and <laughs> you have a car as opposed to a bicycle. Yes. So compare just sort of day-to-day -day life in terms of how you felt about um, your daily plan there, uh, how much of it was dedicated to things like worrying about your car, parking, those kinds of things. Um, just in terms of experience of the European experience, how do people's lives differ? Um, well, when, I, when I was in Maastricht, I would plan my day around um, the weather, mostly, with uh -huh. my bike. Um, when I could swing by the grocery store, I would have to plan for um, a half an hour bike commute to class and back. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about parking because you can put a bike anywhere. Um, but Did you rely on other forms of public transportation, buses, trains? A little bit. <coughs> Only when I had to. Like if we were going to the train station, we'd take the bus there so we wouldn't leave our bike. Um, very easy to get your bike stolen, but yeah. it'll come around painted yeah. a different color a week later. So, <laughs> Well, when you compare um, your life before going to Maastricht and then after as a student, mm -hmm. if you think about the way in which it changed, the way you think about your Otterbein experience. Can you articulate um, how your view of your major and how your view of your minor and how your view really of what you want to accomplish? And then we'll talk about your future in a minute. But let's, let's just talk about the academic program itself. How did that change for you? 
Over there, the, the program was more self-oriented. Um, you had two tests approximately, and that was your whole grade, and you had to learn everything yourself. And you're very compelled to read because if you got behind, you were, you were in trouble. Um, and it's definitely affected the way I study now. I'm, I'm ahead. I'm always, my, my timing's better. They've kind of forced you to schedule everything out yourself. Um, and I really appreciate the independence it gave me in my studies. So were the classes primarily discussion, lecture? They were half, half and half. It was a discussion group um, half the time, and the other half the time it was a big 200-person lecture. Um, but when you're in your, your discussion group, you need to know what you're talking about, and you need to have read. Um, and I learned a lot over there, a lot. Okay, great. Now, let's talk about how this has shaped your future then. Um, you started out um, at Otterbein as someone interested really um, in um, more the cognitive mm -hmm. counseling, those kinds of issues. Uh, you're now looking more at a biological approach. So what does that mean about your future? Well, my original plan was to be like a clinician, maybe deal with some abnormal. Um, but while I was over there, I just, I really loved that neuroscience class and I've looked at psychology in a whole new light. Um, we did a lot of dissection. Um, and I think, I think I want to go to medical school and maybe do neurology instead. I still love the brain, but in a different way, definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, when you think about the future beyond, let's say, you finish your degree. Well, you will finish your degree definitely. at Audubon. Definitely by June. We'll see you on the graduation <laughs> platform. But then you go on to, you have some other classes to finish up mm -hmm. in terms of the life sciences. Let's say you go on to med school. Where do you want to live? Well, let's deal with med school first. <laughs> where do you want to go to med school, do you think? Um, you know, I could see myself in Ohio, but I could also see myself on, on the other side of the Atlantic as well. Um, I could see myself living for several years in Europe after I graduate, mm -hmm. whether it be for med school or after med school mm -hmm. or really any, anything. I would do anything to go back. Would you go back um, to Maastricht or would you go somewhere else in the world? Are you interested in being in another culture? I really like the Dutch culture a lot. I visited a lot of places, a lot of English-speaking places, uh -huh. a lot of foreign-speaking places, and I just really like the Dutch mentality. So what does that mean? The Dutch mentality? Uh -huh. um, they're accepting of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, where I lived, we were so close to Belgium and Germany that there was different languages, there was different cultures, and um, they're very accepting, they're very kind people, they're very open. Um, and. They, they like their Americans. They don't. They don't hate us like maybe some other countries might. So the welcoming environment, Definitely. hospitality, mm -hmm. openness, all those kinds of things. Okay. Um, well, all right. So if you think you might live abroad for some time, and that would probably be back in in Holland, that's where you would like to be. Definitely. Okay. Um, any any future for Northwestern Ohio back in your in your <laughs> I plans? don't think I'm going back to Van Wert. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going back to Van Wert. <laughs> okay. Um, is it Balliot's Coffee Shop? Is oh, that, yes. Do I remember that correctly? Beef and noodles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, didn't, I don't remember Dutch chocolate being on the menu. but No, no, um, no Dutch cooking in Van Wert, which is funny because Van Wert is indeed a Dutch name. So <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, as, you, as you think about this, if you were to give advice, if I were to bring you in, well, obviously we're on a television show here, but... Uh, cable show, um, but if I were to ask you to speak to current students or prospective students at Otterbein, what would you tell them about considering the idea of a global engagement experience? Definitely look into it. Um, not just the traveling aspect, like you have your whole life to see the world, but it will never be like this again. Um, I will never be with that group of people that were my friends that I met. I met so many great people from so many different countries. And you're, you're a student. You're not a, you're not a real person yet. You still have time to have fun. You don't have to worry about so much. Um, you just have your studies and a plane ticket, and you can just go anywhere. And you should definitely look into what you can do. Even a two-week trip, some of the SYEs are two-week trips, would right. be fantastic. Yeah, um, I guess the SYEs are another, uh, another way of fulfilling that mm -hmm. idea of global engagement, which can be done right now. It's done at the end of fall quarter between mm -hmm. uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, so students can go to various places around the world. I think we send students to um, parts of Europe, and I think we send them down to study coral reefs and mm -hmm. Belize and uh, various venues around the world. Um, so you can have a short experience or a long experience. Now, yours was fairly long. What months were you there? I was there from about the last week in August to about a week before Christmas. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. oh, that would have been a nice time to be. 
Yes, it was beautiful over yeah. there. Okay, so, um, and what about um, preparing for this? How, what kind of preparation is necessary if you were, if you were an entering freshman here next fall? How could students best prepare themselves given the course requirements with integrative studies mm -hmm. and the first year experience and the activities that are required really that first year? Is there something that a student should do as early as the first year to get ready for this kind of experience? Um, well, I didn't decide till about my middle of my sophomore year that I was going to go, so it's, it's never too late to decide to go, but um, definitely know which core classes you have to have for Modermine because there's some that won't transfer, but if they don't have your, ma your major in Europe, you can always take equivalents for integrative studies classes, so okay. there's always something to take over there that will transfer back. Okay. Um, all right. So you would recommend it, uh, planning your program around it. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned that there are some constraints. Some programs have constraints that make it difficult mm -hmm. um, to um, really to integrate the idea of a global engagement experience. So that's something we need to look at as we try to provide more opportunities for students. But those two-week and one-month mm -hmm. kinds of experiences at the beginning or end of the school year or in the middle of the school year can really work out. Um, so. I guess as you, as you think about your own future, um, do you feel like this has changed your life? I often hear students tell me it changed their lives. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, and how do you feel like it's changed your life? Um, it's made me a more open-minded person, definitely more open-minded to different cultures. Um, and of course, always the people you meet always change you. And I met a lot of interesting and fun characters over there <clears throat> that changed me as a person, I think maybe a better person. So are you gonna take your parents over? You know, they came with me for the, the first two weeks. Oh, okay. We went on a little vacation together. Um, but I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back by myself again. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, at least they, they got the, to share some of the experience yes, with you in terms of. Well, this, is, this has been very helpful. And um, I want to thank you, Tegan, for taking the time today to, to join me and talk about this. Uh, we're going to be doing um, some shows on the other cardinal experiences, talking with students about the way in which an internship experience or a leadership experience or a creative activity or original research project really did, um, in fact, change their lives as well as the idea of global engagement changing your life. Um, so we'll be doing that in the future, but I want to thank you, Tegan, for taking the time and for sharing your experience with us. And um, I hope you'll stay in touch with us as you go on in your life and let us know how things are in, in Holland in a few years. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Good to have you. History. Fraternities and sororities have been around for about 100 years here at Otterbein. They had a very rocky start. In the beginning, one of the major tenets of the United Brethren Church, which founded Otterbein College, was there would be no secret societies. The precursor to the fraternities and sororities were the literary societies. These were debate societies that taught parliamentary procedure and public speaking. It was very difficult to get into these groups and it was very desirable to be in one of these groups. These groups were the major social outlet at Otterbein in the early 1900s, late 1800s. It was about 1909 that we had the founding of the first secret underground societies, of course. Those were the two men's groups, Pi Kappa Phi and Pi Beta Sigma. About a year later then, of course, uh, the ladies started to form their own, Sigma Alpha Tau being the first. By about 1923, the college was ready to accept, all right, we will allow social groups, but they cannot be in any way, shape, or form related to Greek organizations. 
and it only took about 10 years before that stigma was finally off and the societies were allowed to use their Greek symbols and were deemed fraternities and sororities. They actually truly care about your well-being. They truly want you to help yourself. Their caring and their support really meant a lot and it, and it just it helped me to be able to get up every morning and to know that I could myself function. Right now I am getting ready to graduate for um, medical assisting. I'm in my last six weeks and I've made it. I can't believe I've made it and I actually was so excited when I first enrolled in school I came up here to tell Judy and you know she hugged me and we prayed together and you know she's she was so happy for me and I you know I actually invited her <laughs> I was so excited I invited her to my graduation they don't want to be a handout agency where they just give you things and send you on your way they they really have helped make people more self-sufficient where they just they don't give up they can do things the Westerville Area Resource Ministry is dedicated to helping the needy of our community. And we do it by not offering merely a hand out, but a hand up. Not only do we help people help themselves, but they become a part of the community that gives back as well. I became involved with WARM because of the type of organization that it is. It basically gives back to the community. It's not only a food pantry, it actually helps people try to figure out how to get their lives back on track. They really do offer a service that I have just not seen replicated anywhere else in the community where they can truly take the time with the individual that walks through their doors, um, not only offer them hope and encouragement, but help them get there. It's about people helping people, and we want to reach those who need it most. I was getting hit from different areas with you know different obstacles, and it was a sink or swim situation. I really felt myself sinking and they were kind of like the ones that threw me life preservers. I can say that we have had clients sitting out here with long faces, obviously troubled, and I'll just start talking to them and I'll maybe introduce them to each other and, and the next thing you know they, they might have a smile on their face or something. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm a therapist or anything. Self-sufficiency is the goal for our clients, and we help them get there by offering support, encouragement, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. I work at WARM as our employment services coordinator and work with clients to get them job ready. Those that can work, I work with to um, work on resume writing or interviewing skills. We have them do a goal sheet so that they can eventually become self-sufficient. When I first started coming to WARM, when we um, started setting the goals, I was working in a job that was basically a dead-end job. I could move up in the company, but as far as like providing for my family, I was never going to make enough money to really support my kids and myself comfortably. And I would always be dependent on public assistance or a food pantry to help me, me reach my goals of just providing basic necessities. And by coming to WARM, they help me set goals to where I can actually go to school, and I'm going to school now, and um, I've got, I'm taking steps that are slowly building up towards a good career. Our mentoring program connects a client with a dedicated volunteer. Our mentors help clients deal with a variety of needs. When we're mentoring the clients, uh, we normally meet with them about every two weeks, a uh, face-to-face -face meeting and sometimes a phone call, a card, just depending on what comes up. The mentoring has been wonderful with WARM. I have been a mentor to one woman so far. I'm a nursing student and they have matched us up with a mentor program where um, one, my mentor happens to be a nurse already and um, when I first met her I was a little apprehensive but it was neat to get to know somebody that was already where you're trying to get um, and I think it was a perfect match because you know not only was I at a point where when you get there you're almost ready to either give up or say is this really what I want to do 
you know, she's that little hint of encouragement that tells you, yeah, you know, <laughs> you can do it, you'll be fine. And Westerville is located in one of the fastest growing areas in the state of Ohio. And as the population explodes, so does the need for more resources and volunteers. The needs in Westerville are a little more hidden than you find in inner city Columbus. The reality is they are here. They're below the surface and we need to continue to ferret those out, to look for other opportunities to bring training, to bring education, computer skills, parenting skills to folks in our community that are in need. The need is continually growing. In the first quarter of this year, we saw a huge increase over last year. And so even though we've been able to meet the needs, the demands of the past, we find that with each month, there's a growing need. And so we have, obviously, to find new resources to help us meet those needs. One of the advantages of partnering with one, whether you're a business, a church, or an individual, is what's given here stays here. It goes to help people in the Westerville School District. You can help us in one of the following ways. When I do get on my feet, warm is one thing I will never, ever, ever in my whole life forget. And I don't care if I move to Texas, I'm going to be donating something to them because I know this program worked for me. And now, another adventure with Savings Man. This is great. Every day should be like this. It will be when I retire in a few years. I've been planning and saving. Did you save for me? Well, this is unexpected. Where'd you come from? Out of the blue, just like an illness, an emergency, or That's a... enough, Mr. Unexpected. Savings Man. There's still time to plan. Find out how at ChooseToSave.org with a ballpark estimate worksheet. I will. Thanks, Savings Man. No, thank you. So visit ChooseToSave.org today. In a world of fear, what they needed most was each other. Here comes the monster. The Tickle Monster. <laughs> Just imagine what a little time can do for your family. <laughs> From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The inability to breathe, snot pouring out of your nose, it's a real hairy business. As a firefighter, I'm a student of the weather, and I've noticed that there's a change that's occurred in the last several years. We're having many more large and damaging fires. Sometimes thousands of fires will occur. If the climate changes and we don't have the water we need, California could dry up and blow away. There comes a time in life when you need government information And you just don't know which way to turn USA.gov Find your social security benefits online USA.gov Our list of jobs will put you on cloud nine USA.gov Shop auctions for a used minivan anytime USA.gov It's government made easy For the people USA.gov I've lived in Delhi all my life and I have seen the weather change. The monsoon this year has been more erratic than I can ever remember. We've had, I think, highest temperature in the last 50 years. Growing up, you'd wait for what we call an aandhi, a squall. This year, there's not a drop. Some, some estimates say 2017 Delhi, 15 million people are going to be without water. So you've got a song about where to call for government information? Check this out. We got the benefits and services that'll make you smile to get the answers you need. Put us on speed dial. That is gold, Your Honor. 1-800-FIT-INFO. Oh! 
Here comes the monster. The Tickle Monster. <laughs> Just imagine what a little time can do for your family.